hi everyone. First, for those who want the hookup discount code, DM me if you've never tried AG1. I would love to send it to you. I'm waiting for 800 DMs. I have a great assistant who will help. Uh, I love listening to all of the reflection on what has been a seriously traumatic yet inspiring couple of years. And uh, I go back to Priya's prompt, which is why did you accept this invitation? And I remember when Will reached out to me. It was January of 2020. I have the email to document and prove it. And he said, look, we're doing this welcome conference. I've gotten to know you through being on the board of Milk Bar and the industry, and we're looking to like evolve the speakers. And here I was kind of the queen of fast casual. As you heard, I was the president of Cinnabon. I then ran the parent company. Uh, grew by acquisition, bought these incredible scaling but struggling in many cases brands and applied a playbook and practices and principles to grow them around the world, ultimately 80 countries, uh, almost 8,000 locations of franchise brick and mortar operations, over 100,000 points of retail distribution of grocery product from those restaurant brands long before doing omni-channel restaurant brands was cool, and I thought it was just so special to be invited to this heart of hospitality in the city and here and all of you, and uh, was so excited to plug in. Yet it was January of 2020. About seven days after I got that email from Will, our Asia business, which was one third of our entire business, shut down. About two weeks later, the rest of our business around the world shut down, and then by March of 2020, 100% of our almost 8,000 locations, about 80% of those operated by small business owners, franchisees that owned one or two locations. Yeah, we had a couple mega franchisees that owned hundreds, but they were the exception, not the rule. And now all of these folks whose life savings are invested in these businesses uh, were in extreme peril, as well as their employees. And immediately overnight, this massive, parent company that owned McAllister's Deli, Moe's Southwest Grill, Schlotzky's, Carvel Ice Cream, Jamba Juice, Auntie Anne's, Cinnabon, Seattle's Best Coffee, overnight, completely shut down, no revenue, and needing to protect our employees, both corporate and in the field, and of our franchisees, as much as possible. And a few interesting things beyond that occurred in March of 2020. One, I had made the decision that after being at Focus Brands for 10 years, I was ready to move on. I loved that business and brand, but I no longer wanted to continue with the business. I didn't want to be the CEO, I was the president and COO of this company doing billions in annual sales. And I had spent the last several years investing in earlier stage companies, health and wellness companies. It was where my passion was, small business technology, restaurant technology. I knew I wanted to be kind of earlier in the S-curve of the industry. So I had a plan to leave in January of 2020. And as a result, the private equity firm, who had been incredible partners, uh, selected a new CEO. And he also started in January of 2020. And so my plan to leave to advise, to invest, to just lean into my board of directors' work um, was disrupted heavily for a few reasons. One, there's no good time to leave after 10 years with a company that you love, but at the beginning of a pandemic, when it is being turned upside down, is a really shitty time to go. Now, some may look at it differently, like, hey, sister, that's the right time to leave, like exit stage right before this gets bad, but um, I could think of no more important time to be there. Also, new CEO, not from the industry, didn't even know where the bathrooms were, and that wouldn't matter, because it was all closed. <laughs> and it was time for the team to lead and for him to step back and just observe and see what the team was made of. At the same time, literally March of 2020, my seven-month-old daughter got incredibly ill, ended up in the ICU for two weeks with a horrible respiratory virus that was not COVID, um, but almost died a few times. And I remember seeing her in the hospital being on ear pods with my franchisees who were losing their noodles around the world, working with uh, everyone across the company who, of course, none of us had the scar tissue for this. No one had the playbook. And so we just leaned on the experiences and lessons from unexpected places, which is what I want to share with you today. And you have your own, and hopefully not only listening to mine, 
uh, and taking some of these lessons and frameworks and practices forward to your own business, no matter where you are in the journey, also inspires you to look back at your own life and see where there may be lessons, greatness, and frameworks that you can see and apply yourself, not just from others, but taking the time to reflect on what you've learned from your experiences. From that point, March of 2020, taking my daughter home, she got better, thank goodness, navigating her, pulling out her feeding tube from her nose, the ear, <laughs> AirPods again, talking with franchisees and team members. I have never felt so much boss mom energy as I did in those early weeks. You guys remember, no PPE, costs going up 10X, fighting, negotiating, clamoring for gloves and sanitizer, all kinds of confusing regulations. And if you're a multi-unit business in multiple counties, much less multiple states, much less multiple countries, keeping up with like what you were supposed to do was impossible. Then mass mandates, customer fights <laughs> over those mass mandates, employee confusion, and navigating that around the world, again, was stressful, but I was so glad, even while I was standing over my daughter and navigating such a tough time, I was so glad it was me. It was one of those moments that I'm reminded how important it is to reframe what you're going through as I get to versus I have to. I knew that I would lean in to our teams and our franchisees with so much heart and care. I knew that I would do the same for my daughter. I knew that it was time to have laser focus for our team, even though this was unprecedented for all of us, and we had a mantra. We're focused on two things. If you don't have something that adds value to these two things, don't talk to me about it. Protect people, protect cash. That was it. Because those literally are the two things that will give us the potential to survive and thrive. Not even guaranteed, the potential. And I remember being asked by a few franchisees, how do you know how to navigate this? And the reality is I didn't and no one did. Because even if I had had similar expenses, I, experiences, I did inherit an incredibly challenged brand in the heart of the Great Recession. I became president of Cinnabon in 2010. It was a bakery business based in malls and airports. Newsflash, when there is compressed discretionary income, there are two things people stop doing, shopping and traveling. Our revenues were in the toilet multiple years in a row, those small business owners were not well capitalized to navigate that storm. And I'll tell you, the last person a bank would lend money to during the heart of the recession, which is a first time franchisee operating a business in malls, also at the beginning of the retail apocalypse, selling a cinnamon roll the size of your face at the height of the Atkins Christ. <laughs> no thanks, next in line. It was like layers of distress. And even that, which we navigated beautifully, and there are business cases about how we transformed the business through that difficult time. But even that did not prepare me for this. What prepared me were the lessons from all the unexpected places. I did stay, we did navigate with grace uh, and clarity and care, we did protect cash, we did protect people. Our franchisees emerged much faster than many other businesses. And in fact, most of them, not all, thrived in ways they did not before. In years prior, we had launched third-party delivery. Five years prior. It was painful, it wrecked our operations, none of our franchisees wanted to do it because who wants to pay 30% of your top line, which is what it was at the time, for what was one or two points of incremental sales. And in cities and markets where it was viewed as not something that would take hold and scale. I remember literally working with the bikers with Postmates to get pretzels from malls to apartments in New York City. And it was more of a thing here, and then we did it in Indianapolis, and then Chicago. And franchisees fought it every step of the way. You know what saved the business coming out of the pandemic? The ability to deliver out of those malls and use them as kitchens and not restaurants. If we had to start at zero, as many people did, those operations would have never come back online as fast as they did. And this was even more true in our non-mall and airport-based businesses. Doing the right thing before we absolutely had to, which was painful, is what saved us. This idea of leading, leading in unexpected ways, either leading on defense, how you react to something 
that will create a fork in the road that shapes your opportunity, or leading proactively before you need to, or something I think we've all gotten good at, whether we like it or not, which is leading even with a heavy heart. We navigated that difficult year. The franchisees thrived, restructured the company for growth, and then a year later, I left. I ended up leaning into what my original plan was, which was advising and board work, and one of the companies I was advising was a venture-backed, or at the time, bootstrapped, um, hyper-growth nutrition company called Athletic Greens. I fell in love with the idea of convenient nutrition as a busy mom. I thought, something this good shouldn't be a best-kept secret of athletes and biohackers. One scoop and I get my multivitamin, my probiotic, my phytonutrients, yes, please sign me up. I wanna tell everybody, including my parents, and I don't care if it's not as big as the companies I've run before, and I don't care if it's not something like a household name, like all the brands that I've run before. I wanna make an impact, and it became my mission in the way that you heard uh, earlier, actually, with Union Square Play, to take the principles of hospitality and nourishment and care and apply it to that industry. And yet navigating all of those different things came from some of the most unexpected places. One, I started as a hostess when I was 17 years old at Hooters restaurants. It was awesome. <laughs> I was the first person in my family to ever go to college. I had to pay for school, we were incredibly poor. Then I became a waitress when I turned 18. At the age of 19, I was so fortunate that that company was growing globally, and I got a phone call from my general manager, Bonnie, who herself had been a Hooters girl, and she said, hey, I just got a call from the corporate office, the company's growing around the world, they're looking for trainers to expand the brand, uh, and they wanna know if you wanna go to Sydney, Australia. And I was like, hell yes. <laughs> However, I did not have a passport. I had never been on a plane. I had never opened a restaurant before. I'd only been out of the state of Florida twice in my life for cheerleading competitions and track competitions. Yet I, yet I said yes. I bought my first ever plane ticket, flew to Miami, stood in line, got my passport expedited, left a couple weeks later to go launch the first ever Hooters franchise in Sydney, Australia. Stayed there for 40 days, learned a lot about opening a restaurant, translating a brand in a new country, but I thought, when I flew back, who would ever give a girl like me a chance like that again? And the answer is this amazing industry and that incredible company. About 60 days later, I left again to go launch the franchise first ever in Central America in Mexico City. That would happen over and over. I launched four continents by the time I was 20 years old. And I learned some pretty crazy things about leadership through that experience. A few highlights. One, every time I went to one of those countries to launch the brand, I was leading a new team that I'd never met before. You try to run your business every two months with a team you've never met. It's a very interesting leadership mirror. After about the third opening in the third country with a third different team, the things that were going wrong, I was the only common denominator. You sort of have to like look at your patterns <laughs> over time. And, and I realized that I needed to be asking different questions because whatever I was doing before was not working or getting better country by country, market by market. It was one of the first times I learned this phrase. Answers don't scale, questions do. Just because I kept getting chosen to lead these openings didn't mean I had it all right. And no one was coming to save me or help me from the corporate office. We went to launch the franchise in Argentina, and we had done none of the work that a sophisticated, growing global business should do to customize the business, the brand, and the menu. We had steak, but it was like a shitty like ribeye steak on a flat top. Do you want to know how to royally, royally drive Argentinians insane? Put <laughs> steak on something that doesn't have fire. It was viewed as um, disrespectful. We had beans, baked beans. It's like a cool barbecue thing in the US. It was viewed as a pauper's food at the time. It instantly removed our restaurant from casual dining to something lesser than, and we had no idea. The employees would not come out of the bathroom in their uniforms. And I'm like, you guys are naked on the beach. What is wrong with orange shorts? <laughs> All of these things should have been realized, and I learned about asking smart questions. Then the franchisee, gave me some really great advice. He sat me down, because it was a hot mess of an opening, and he sat me down and he said, anytime you're criticized, just assume first it's correct. And then if you can't stomach that, if really there is no shred of accuracy, 
that instead of debating the what, you'll focus on the why and the how, and you'll preserve a relationship and move things forward. But if there is a shred of accuracy, you will save face, not put your foot in your mouth, focus on whatever is going on, make it better, and also preserve relationships to move forward. And it actually had reminded me of this time when I was a Hooters girl, and there was this customer. And for a couple of Fridays in a row, he brought in a, a table of buddies, and they ordered 50 wings and a couple pitchers of beer. That's a pretty good table. And no one wanted this table. He hadn't quite got to the point where he was banned from the restaurant, but he was quite complicated. You know, there's a short list of people you ban, very short list. And here's what he would do. He would come in and order 50 wings, and after all the wings were decimated, a plate of bones, he would say, there were only 40. Am I gonna count the bones? <laughs> no. Um, but this happened multiple Fridays in a row with different servers, and word spread. Then when he walked in, they were like, oh, here comes the 50-40 guy. <laughs> so when I got him, he ordered 50 wings, I brought them out, and before they finished, I placed an order in the computer with my discount code and rung up 10 wings and brought them out to the table before they could be finished. Said, I just want to make sure there were 50. He never did it again. I got tipped 100 bucks. <laughs> it was amazing. And back to Priya's question, is the customer always right? Of course not. But they're always the customer. And there's always a way. And I also think about the time when corporate came to give our general manager a GM of the quarter award for our high sales. And I remember the staff congregating in the service weight area, joking about how ridiculous it was because he was such a horrible human. The reality was there was construction in the neighborhood, which drove a ton of business to the restaurant. And yet he was being celebrated as a great leader. And I remember thinking, you know, these moments, you just don't forget, they get burned into your mind. I remember thinking, I will always question success more than failure. Sometimes there are things driving our success that have nothing to do with what we're doing. In fact, we might be successful despite what we're doing. I became obsessed with knowing the truth, talking to crew members, staying close to the action. I would then go on to open all of these restaurants, and at the age of 20, uh, I got offered a corporate job. I had been traveling so much that I was failing college, much to my mother's disappointment. I dropped out of college, I'm a college dropout, took the corporate gig at Hooters Corporate, moved to Atlanta. As the company grew, I grew. By the time I was 26, I was vice president of the company doing 800 million in revenue, helped grow the company to uh, 30 countries around the world. We launched an airline, super bad idea for a restaurant company. <laughs> um, <laughs> we shut down the airline. <laughs> And I will be forever grateful for what was an incredible, yet funky and odd and unexpected and sometimes controversial 14 years of my career. And then I took over Cinnabon as president during the recession. And there were so many things that I learned from that experience. One was, much like the time many of us have been through, leadership is required. It is required, it is an honor, um, it is a privilege, and it is required. And if you are not ready to do it, get out of the way. And I, I, it, these tough times reveal many folks who just swirl, right? And I remember one time going back to Hooters, all the cooks walked out. I don't, it's an open kitchen, if you don't know, and I don't know what happened. Somebody, like, stole their weed or something. Like, everybody left. <laughs> and when... <laughs> When you're in an open kitchen restaurant and the people preparing your food exit the building, it's really obvious. And out of, out of the whole staff, there was, I think, 12 of us on the shift. Only two of us hopped back to go cook. And the manager, of course. It's like chicken wings. When they float, they're done. <laughs> not hard. Um, and not that I'm taking away from the like expertise and quality that's required to do it really well. Um, and, but I learned something about people during crisis, and that is a, such a small thing compared to the crisis we've gone through. But in the moment when you're relying on tips and you know, the food that sort of drives the tipping is not coming out, it's a crisis. 
there are like different people. People react a different way. One is the maintainers, right? People are just kind of trying to help talk and bridge. And then there are others that sort of complain and are kind of scared, paralyzed by fear. And then there are others who jump into the fire and I'm totally an operator and I'm a jump into the fire person. And, and we all have our role in this world. Um, and so when I joined Cinnabon, it was, it was instinct to go straight to the operations. And I'll share a few rapid fire frameworks with you that have taken me from Cinnabon to launching what is um, the largest multi-channel restaurant brand in the world. Um, billions in consumer product sales with the Cinnabon brand and then repeating that with Annie Ann's and repeating that with Carvel and repeating that with other brands to expand the brand yet actually use those proceeds to fund the legacy business, the franchise of brick and mortar, the in-person experience. All the way through to being the president of the parent company, managing nine presidents of brands that are all at very different points in their continuum to running a venture-backed, super hyper growth nutrition company. One, I ask three questions of everyone. And if you are a note taker, you'll definitely want to take notes. Um, I ask three questions of everyone. These are frameworks. Remember, I said answers don't scale, questions do. If you ask these questions at various points at enough frequency to catch up with the level of change, you will get the answers you need that matter to your team and your business, not what I tell you to do for my business that has like meh relevance to what you're doing. The questions I ask my team still today, one, what is one thing, everybody, every single stakeholder, what is one thing we should stop doing? When I took over Cinnabon, I asked that question. The way I asked the question was, what do you throw away? What do you see our customers throw away? What I'm actually getting at is, what are we investing time, money, and resources in doing? That isn't adding value. Next question is the opposite. What should we start doing? The way I ask that question in the hospitality business is, when do we say no? When do we say no consistently? Why would we be saying no consistently in different locations in different cities? Because something is shaping the expectations of the people asking, the market, competition. Why oh why would five franchisees in five different states be getting asked the same thing of their crew members and saying no and getting asked the same thing of customers and saying no? Because the market is shaping the expectations. What were we being asked for when we were saying no? Smaller portions. Very easy for any of us to sit in this room and say, well, yeah, of course. But amazing operators with their life savings involved and invested not only miss the obvious things to do, but resist the right things to do out of understandable fear. Our franchisees were in the recession. They were super scared of selling anything that was smaller and less lower priced when they were already struggling to get sales. They were afraid of trade down. I'm struggling to get people to buy a $5 thing, and the reality is they were all jacking up their prices. I'm like, ultimately, you're gonna sell like $1 million cinnamon roll to one person if you keep raising the prices and degrading your traffic. And they were afraid of trade down. And I learned this through my questions. The third question is, what's one thing you would do differently if you were me to make the business better? One thing to stop doing, one thing to start doing, one thing you would do differently if you were me to make the business better. Ask everyone in a short period of time. Your vendors, your partners, your customers, those who have left you, your employees, your managers, your team members, your stakeholders, and look for patterns, not one-offs. All my frameworks, this and the next few I'm gonna rattle off really quickly, are a pattern, are a form of ask, answer, act. Everything. If you just ask, you're just researching. You're just a student. If you only walk around with the answers, you're a, a bull in a porcelain shop and you'll get some things done, but you will not have a team that will follow you. And if all you do is act, something similar occurs. Ask, answer, act. Then I developed check-ins, monthly check-ins with my direct reports. I now do this with my husband, who I've been with for seven years. <laughs> I know, it sounds super scary, but it's awesome, I promise. Um, here's the questions. There are six. What's been the best part of the last 30 days? You'll hear a pattern to these questions. What's been the worst part of the last 30 days? What's one thing I can do differently to be a better partner for you? What has worried you or weighed on you the most in the last 30 days? 50% of the time when I ask this question agnostic of culture or gender or age, there are tears. The world is fucking heavy. What has worried you the most or weighed on you in the last 30 days? What are you most proud of from the last 30 days? What are you most grateful for? I ask you, you answer one question, you ask me. Two way, I'm not the leader trying to like be your therapist. This is about us connecting, so check-ins. 
Then I developed something called the hot shot rule. It's simply this. I imagine someone I admire. I then envision them in my role tomorrow. I'm gone, you're there. I don't have time, bless you. I don't have time to say thank you, fire the person I need to fire, hire the person I need to hire, fix the equipment, I'm gone, you're there. And then I ask, what is one thing in the first thing that you would immediately do if you were in my shoes to make the business better? And then I ask, why can't that be me? And then I take action on it in 24 hours. And then the last step, I tell my team. I started practicing this quarterly, it became monthly. I do this every Sunday when I put my three-year-old down for a nap that somehow is still there. Every week, I demonstrate vulnerability and a bias for action by literally saying something I wasn't addressing that I should have been. Not that not I thought about it, I'm thinking about it, it's on my radar. I took action or I put it in motion. Vulnerability, bias for action. I also have my direct reports do the same thing. And again, when people ask, like, how do you know to do these things during such tough times and these frameworks, I got it from one place, my mom. When I was nine years old, my mom came to me and said, that's it, I'm done, we're leaving. And what she meant was, we were leaving my father. My father was and is a very sweet man, but at the time was an alcoholic. I was in three car accidents by the time I was nine years old. And yet when my mom came to me and said we were leaving, I did not cry and I did not get upset. I looked at her and said, what took you so long? At the age of nine, the reason I ask all those questions, the reason I use the asking and answering as a driver for action is because I learned in that moment that the people who are closest to the action know what the right thing to do is long before the leader makes the call. Most of the answers we need are there. And because my mom did that, we left. She fed us on a food budget of $10 a week for three years. She worked three jobs, and now the circle is complete. You see why I needed to start working anywhere and everywhere that would take me at a very young age, and then made the most that I could out of those opportunities from this great industry, and then landing me back to the mantra that I live by, that I navigate teams and brands by, that I hope you'll keep in your heart and in your mind as you continue to navigate change with these lessons from unexpected places, is don't forget where you came from, but don't you dare ever let it solely define you. Our truth and our history is our roots, but our past must not be our anchor. Thank you very much. <laughs>